s a l ม o n PODCAST มันสดอร่อย In the name of work podcast, getting your work to really work with Parit w a t r a s i t In collaboration with Rise. Hi everyone, welcome back to In the Name of Work podcast. This is Parit w a t r a s i t your host, and in this podcast, I will be taking you through a conversation with eight guest speakers in eight very different but all very exciting areas of work. Where I'll be sharing techniques on how to work efficiently, how to work effectively, and how to work with a lot of fun, or as we say. How to get your work to really work for you. In this episode, we are accompanied by our guest speaker, Dr. K- Jacob Greenspan. Um, Dr. Jacob is an, is an expert in UX/UI. He's worked as a strategic UX consultant for over 300 companies um, across the world. Welcome, Dr. Jacob. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy and delighted to be on board with you here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us. Where are you um, recording this podcast from? Well, actually, Corona days. I'm at my office, home office, in uh, my working study room in Israel, in a little city near Tel Aviv, about twenty thirty kilometers from Tel Aviv, and that's where I am. Uh, okay, so I think um, the first question I want to start off with um, asking you to explain a little bit about what is UX UI. So, for people who are not familiar with product design, people who are not familiar with the world of kind of user experience and user interface, and what is the difference between the two? Oh, that's great. That's a great question to start with. So, um, you know, um, UI. Let's talk about terminology. Let's start with terminology. UI refers to user interface or user interaction. Both are acceptable. Today, we are mainly using user uh, uh, interface interaction. Sorry, and not user interface, but. Both are being used, and UX is user experience. Now it's written with X instead of E, but that's life. That's a user experience. What the experience of the users? Generally speaking, we'll get into the difference between UI and UX, as you ask in in a few second uh, time from now. But generally speaking, we're talking about the fit. It's a fit between the product that we are building and the users and their abilities and their wishes and what they love and what do they want to do and so forth. And of course, the environment. So, if, for example, you take any mobile app, it should fit to what you should do, can do, need to do, want to do, and so forth. So, this is UI UX in general. It's all about the fit. Okay. Uh, later on, we'll get deeper dive, I guess, into fit into our brain abilities, our processing information system here. But in general, it's this fit. And for many many years, UI was referred to more the logical part of the design, and UX was referred for more for the visual side of the design. Lately, when I say lately, it's about seven ten years, maybe less, maybe slightly more, slightly less. Uh, there's a little shift there. Okay, so some people will talk about the UX, and some people will talk about as the logical part, and the UI more about the you know the visual side. And when I say logical, I mean how should it behave. What should it do? What is the interaction? Which emotions should be evoked, and so forth. So, to make a long story short, whenever tip number one in, from this podcast, whenever you want to uh, to start using UI UX, it's a very good practice to ask, "What do you mean by UI or by UX?" It's a very good practice because in some countries, and I've been traveling a lot, UI is what we call UX here in Israel, and vice versa. So. It's not the same all over the globe, but the profession is always the same. It's all about creating applications, products that people would like to use and would love to use. Yep. So I think the two concepts intertwine, right? Now, kind of to to make the distinction a little bit clearer, are you able to think of an example of a product that you would say has a very good UX but not such a good UI, or the other way around? I think that maybe can visualize uh, what we mean um, in terms of difference between the two. Hmm, that's a good point. Um, I always try to avoid negative or bad examples, so I give just a general example. If it's okay, I always respect another other people work. Um, there are some uh, things which doesn't look great or doesn't um, make you feel great, but they are highly functional and they are great. Okay, um, let's take let's take the other way around. Let's talk about cars. Okay. Cars look great. People want to buy them. People want to use them. And in so many cases, unfortunately, there are car accidents. Okay. Um, so usability-wise, when I say usability, I mean our ability to use it. Cars are kind of good, but in so many cases, 
unfortunately they may might hurt you and even kill you right if you're using it the wrong way um so this is you i you x wise there's some improvements needed over there experience the way they look the way they behave it's generally just great and i'm not referring to any specific car by the way you can immediately see the safety systems getting into cars today they're simply trying to eliminate this hazardous area that is to make it much safer and this will cover it all okay and and there are many many other examples uh, anyone who's listening to this podcast can think about an application that looked really really great in the uh, play store in the apple store he or she downloaded them and then when they started to use it they didn't figure out how to use it that's a great example of the poorly designed ux with a great ui okay and and I hope it's okay. I I always avoid to, to to give any negative example. Always positive. That's my motto in life. That's great, um, Jacob. I think I love your example with cars, right? Because I think um, the question I want to ask is, do do con- what do consumers put a greater value in um, between UX and UI? Because if I think of a car with a with the best UX, I think of a car that's very easy to use. I think we're moving towards like self driving cars, even right. But if you think about um, a great UI, you might think of all these sports cars which sell for a very high price. So what do consumers really care about in your experience between UX and UI? Oh, that's a great question. Um, as always, I'll try to complicate things slightly a little bit. So let me know uh, l- later on if I did it too much. There's a great researcher in Israel. It's, his name is uh, Noam Truktinsky. Okay. And he made a very interesting experiment many, many years ago. He created four types of ATM systems, right, for money withdrawal. You can think about it as a matrix of two by two, right? And you can look at it for in, in Google Scholar, you'll find the article, fascinating one. One of them looked great and behaved great, okay? So it had a great UI and a great UX. The other one looked great, but behaved in a poor way. That is, it was kind of hard to use it. So we may say that it had a great UI and kind of a poor UX or kind of poor usability, okay? UX and usability are not as exactly the same, but for the sake of this discussion, I think it's good enough. Okay, the third one was very good UI, looked really great, and, and sorry, vice versa. And, you know, so any combination between, I lost, sorry, I lost tracking. So they were two by two. One of them looked great, behaved great. One of them looked great, behaved very poor. One of them looked really poor, behaved poor. And one of them looked really poor and behaved great. Now, great, sorry. Now he gave the, the, this uh, ATM systems to subjects in the university. And then he asked them to evaluate how easy was it for them to use it. Not how beautiful they were, how easy was it to use it. And he unsurprisingly found out that the one that looked poor, behaved poor, was rated as the lower one, right? And the one that looked great and behaved great, rated as the best one. But here comes the interesting part. The one that looked really good but behaved in a poor way, okay, was rated higher than the one that looked poor but behaved in a good way, okay, in a better mm-hmm. way. So I'm not saying by no means, please don't cut it in the editing. I'm not saying that you should invest in the, only in the way that it should look. But I'm trying to say that our perception is highly influenced by these two factors, okay? And you must, simply must make sure it will look great and will behave the right way for the users, okay? And I'm not saying that, now, the, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that it should, the most important thing it, it's that it should look great. It's a must for these two conditions to, uh, to take part in order to create a great and successful application. So I guess my next question would be, um, can you become an expert in one area without kind of basic knowledge in, in another? Or do, you, do these two things kind of go together such that, if, such that if someone wants to go into UX, UI, they kind of need to beef up their skills in both? That's a fascinating question, in my opinion. Thank you for asking it. Um, I've been around for 20-something years in this industry. I've created, uh, established the biggest company in Israel with a partner for UX design. Uh, it was called UI, by the way. That days, it was there was no expression UX, by the way, back in 2010 or 2009. And I found myself running a company with 57 employees about... Um, 10 years later, so I sold it. <laughs> but let's, let's put it aside. And uh, when we started, there was a, cr- a very clear distinguished dis- dis- uh, differentiation between 
those who design the logic of the application of the UX, today we call it UX, okay? how should it behave, what should be the logic, what would be the mental model, what should be the concept of the system, how can I navigate from one place to another place, what are the warning messages that I'm going to present, and so forth, and so forth, and the graphic department. We called it graphic designers, okay? Later on, I think uh, there's sort kind of consolidation for a certain degree. Uh, today, you can find many, many people who make both UI and UX together. So they have, they're highly skilled in creating visual design and they're highly skilled in creating logical design, what I call logical. By the way, the industry doesn't necessarily call it logical. They would call it, you know, this experience design, okay? Having said that, there are still many, many people who specializes only on the visual aspects and there are many, many people who specialize only on the UX aspect. Like me, for example, if you ask me to draw one line, it would be probably very poorly designed, okay? I'm not the guy for that. And it depends on the systems. The more complex the systems are, typically you will find more specifically oriented or experts in a specific field. I think it's common to any field, not only for UI, UX design, right? And so to make a long story short, people can get into this, in my humble opinion, fascinating area. And from getting from many, many directions, they can get it being great visual designers and then learn a little bit more or a lot more about the UX. And they can be UX designers and stop there or sometimes they go into the... So there's a mixture. I, I'm familiar with hundreds of UX experts all over the globe and really hundreds and the variety is so big, which is great, of course. Well, personally for you, how did you get into this world of, of UX UI? What kind of the initial spark that made you decide to, to enter this field? Not many people know that, but I love technology. I'm a short kind of an in, inside, deep inside, I'm an engineer. I'm a, not a UX guy. Okay, so um, I actually started to learn electrical engineering back in God knows when it was, and I quit it after one year, so I'm not qualified to be an electrical engineer. But I was always fascinated by the meeting point between human and technology. Okay, and this this is what we call the, the interface, right? What is user interface? It's the interface for the user by the machine. By the way, if, you, if machine could talk, they would say these are machine interface, that is human beings are being interfacing with them, of course, but machines can't talk, fortunately or unfortunately, it's by the eye of the beholder. But having said that, um, yes, yeah, so I was fascinated about this interaction or this meeting point. And as I like think about things more globally, I found this uh, area to be fascinating. And I asked myself, what should I do in order to get into this field? And then I realized that there's one aspect we haven't spoke right till now, um, Parit, but the thing is the brain abilities to process information. If you like, I can elaborate that, uh, on that later on. But having said that, it's all about the brain abilities to process information. For example, you are now watching me or hearing me, right? And your brain is so busy. You're listening to me right now. You're looking at the clock, at, right, at the watch. Is this guy talking too much, Jacob? Or isn't he talking too much? Are we on time or aren't we on time? Is the sound quality okay? In my case, I can hear the air condition. I don't wear earphones right now, but my brain can ignore it and so forth. And whenever we use an application, there are so many brain activities happening out there. So what I learned was cognitive psychology. So I went to learn cognitive psychology, which is psychology, and then I made my PhD there. And I hope that I do understand a little bit about the way that our brains process information. So that's my take on UX. How can we handle this huge amount of information? Mm. You mentioned a lot about um, designing UX for technology or for applications, right? Is there like a golden rule to what makes a good kind of experience on an application? I mean, we often hear things like you minimize the number of clicks for the end user. What are these kind of typical golden rules that you normally stick to when designing um, that process? That's a $1 million question, man. Um, <laughs> I wish it was that easy, <laughs> Barry, to understand, to, to answer this question. Um, unfortunately, there's no one rule. Or there, in my humble opinion, there's no rule. For example, okay? First of all, let's start with the question, okay? Sorry. Let's pedal back. Let's start with the question. There's no good or bad user interface. This phone here, right? Is it a good interface? Does it possess a good interface or a bad interface? So the whole question is, for whom? 
Is it for a good interface for someone at my age, which might be perfectly okay? If someone who's younger than me and wants some, you know, some more vivid application, okay, or vivid interface, or if it's for older people um, who has some motor uh, challenges when the icons are too small. So as you can easily see immediately that the product itself, the usability of the product is one of the outcome of the usage of the, of the application, right? So for one person, that's the best thing is the invention of the sliced bread. And for other person, this interface is terrible. You simply can't use it, okay? If I take a mobile app and get out to Israeli sun, I've been in Bangkok many times. It's kind of uh, humid and hot, but I think that uh, in Israel, we have slightly more light whenever you go out there in the street. And, um, and some fonts are which are, for example, gray over white, can't be red. So is it a good or a bad interface? Well, it has to do with the country, with the illumination, with the time of the day, and so forth. So this is one. Second, as your per se second question, as I said before, whenever I give some classes here in local university here in Israel, and my first question is always the question that you ask. I ask my students, what is a good interface and what is a bad interface? And they give me great answers, and then I tell them, Typically, it says all about the fit. It's all about the fit, okay? And for example, uh, measuring clicks. This is one thing that many people do whenever they design UX. They say, let's minimize the amount of interaction, right? If I get into a, 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 a building and the doors open slides quietly and automatically, there's an interface between me and the doors. I didn't have to do anything, but simply by walking, I was interfacing with the building and it opened its door, right? So... That's one, but going back, so it's a great interface, but thinking about clicking, counting clicks, for example, okay? Sometimes you can save two clicks in your funnel, but people won't understand the application, okay? So for example, understanding the application is 10 times more important for me as a designer. That's Jacob's perspective. I guess other UX experts might tell you a different story, okay? Uh, but you have asked for my opinion. So, if, for example, I'm uh, now trying to design something for me, um, number, rule number one is that to make sure that people will understand, okay? And if they don't understand, I don't mind adding a few steps or clicks to make sure that they understand. I mean, don't make them exhausted. Don't bore them, of course. But make sure that they understand it's even much more important than the number of clicks. So, there are no thumb of rules, uh, rules of thumb, sorry, so I can share with my audience, unfortunately, other than, you know, very general ones. Sorry. Yeah, so I think one thing you mentioned as well is that like a good UX UI, it's not necessarily the same for everyone. Right? So each different user will have different needs. So for example, if I ask my grandfather, he probably prefers a phone with very large text. If you ask me, I probably prefer a much, a much smaller text, right? So I guess the key to that is for companies to really understand um, the needs of their user segments, right? Um, what techniques can you share for, for companies who want to kind of better understand their users? Is it simply a matter of going out there and asking them um, to try out the application, try out the product? What are the different techniques or methods that we can use to really understand what our users think about our product? That's perfect. Um, so first of all, there's a huge, um, huge body of uh, techniques and literature dealing with what we call user research and usability testing. So first of all, we call it user research. If you're making a product, I'm, I'm not sure how many, peop, um, how many out of our audience are product managers, but any product managers, any marketer in the market knows that it's all about product market fit, right? Create the right product for the right market. Having said that, you can think about it as product user fit, okay? You should fit the product to the user itself, or himself, sorry, or herself, of course. So having said that, you have to make sure that you... A, know exactly who the users are, and B, to make sure that the product you have just designed is all fit into or fits into their needs, their what they what they want to do and so forth. Okay. So having said that, this is the general overview of it. Now there are many many techniques. Okay. Um, for example, uh, ethnographic research. Ethnographic research is a case that you get out there, get involved with the users, see how the life looks like and so forth. Okay. Um, you'll be amazed if you simply go home and observe someone doing something that you were sure that you fully know and understand the task. 
you will be absolutely amazed about how many things you're going to find out. Now, there are many, many techniques for observation. For example, there are links analyses, and I won't get into it right now. There are many, many t- sub-techniques there. It's so such an evolved and developed area, domain of expertise, that in many, many countries, there are two completely different and distinguished tasks. One is UX designer, and one is UX researcher. And when I say researcher, I'm not meaning research in the university, which I really like, don't misunderstand me. I'm thinking research in, in real life, not that the university are not in real life, of course, but out there, okay? So, for example, let's assume I want to make a better cup. If it's okay, is it okay, um, Perry, that I give example, not from apps, is it okay from time to time? Okay? Yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, take a look, have a look at this glass, okay? Let's assume that I want to, to create a glass for someone who's using Zoom, okay, while meeting, okay? Um, I'm just improvising right now. I didn't think about it before, so maybe <laughs> I hope it will be okay, okay? So, for example, um, one question that I would ask myself, how often do I raise my glass while making a Zoom conversation, a typical one? And, for example, how many times have I looked at the glass before raising the glass back, okay? So, for example, if I find out that you people, which are now using some glasses of water for Zoom meetings, um, tend not to look at the glass, and then I'll find out by observation, by interviews, by many, many techniques, that they tend to take the glass and simply split it, because they haven't looked at the glass, then probably a glass for Zoom meeting should have a very wide base, okay? So it won't flip over while making this conversation, right? So all of a sudden, this is completely imaginary. Please, please don't start designing glasses for Zoom meetings. It's just an imaginary example, even a little grotesque one, but it's good enough for us, okay? By simply making a very simple observation of users using glasses in their daily life, I will be better knowing, uh, better understand and know how to design the best glass for Zoom meeting. And it goes on. For example, I will observe that while drinking, you see my mouth through the glass. Now it biased everything. So maybe it should be transparent because my mouth might look really scary when I'm drinking, so forth and so forth. Things that we haven't thought about before and we can't think about before, before we get out there, interview our users and so forth. Okay? The second part is what we call usability testing. Um, usability testing, um, is it okay, uh, Parry, that I'll elaborate on that? Because this is number one. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So usability testing is all about getting out there and see your users actually using the product that you are using. Okay? And when I say see, I mean in a very uh, distinguished way. You typically provide them a task to do with the product that you have made. Let's assume I made a product which is for... I don't know, a restaurant reservation, okay? And then I see how do they use the application? Where do they understand? Where don't they understand? What are the challenges? What are the, what we, we call it a friction points. At points where the user is has some friction with the application, when then it's harder for them to use the applications, okay? And we typically do it by using Think Aloud. That's a very nice technique. You go out there, mm. And you ask your users to say out loud whatever goes through their minds. And mm. typically they feel really weird about that because most people don't say, okay, let me just have a cup, a cup of a uh, glass of water. Let me just or use my mouse. Okay, so let me just take my hand and move it to the right and to the left. We don't do that, right? Um, but when you ask them to do so, it reflects the way they think. And then you simply understand, oh my goodness, how can't they understand that? Well, the fault is not within your users. The fault is always is within your design, and so you can improve it, okay? So you start by user research, and then you go to usability testing. There are techniques to do it. There are some ethics points. You must make them sure, make sure that they have, you have their consent and so forth, and you know, don't pressurize them and feel, treat them in a good, honest way and so forth. But that's the technique, the details themselves. So, yes... Um, unfortunately, I've met so many startups all over the globe which simply don't run any decent usability testing or user research, or actually vice versa, and then they design a perfect product for no one. <laughs> my, my next question is actually related to that point, which is that um, I don't know in your experiences consulting with clients whether there is a different challenge between getting a startup or getting uh, the management team to design a new product 
versus redesigning an existing product. Because in the latter case, there might be a sense of pride um, that product managers might have in their existing product. And therefore, um, the way they conduct these kind of researches and these surveys and focus group and these testing might not be completely free of bias. Have you experienced that in the past? Yes. <laughs> Actually, I've experienced that in the past. I'm experiencing right now, and I'm probably surely going to experience this in the future. Uh, by the way, what you are mentioning right now, it's not unique to startups. It doesn't matter if you're a 100 years company. I haven't worked with any, but let's assume. And your product manager or your designer are simply think that what they are doing right now is the best, okay? And there are many, many biases out there. You said the bias pirate, but there are many, many biases. For example, um, curse of knowledge. Curse of knowledge is a bias. It's a cognitive bias, by the way which is all about the be, being unable to think from the eyes of the user, okay? So if you have a knowledge, for example, and you want to think from through the eyes of someone who doesn't possess this knowledge, then it's almost impossible for you. It's very, not for you in person, of course, for us as human beings. Okay, this is exactly why we make usability testing and ask them to say out loud whatever they think. And then you say, how can't they understand it? Well, they don't understand it because they don't have this bird eye view of anything. Now, let me connect the dots. If we're talking about uh, some person who is using uh, or some um, product manager who wants to improve his or her uh, product, okay, in many, many cases, they will fall in love with their own product. Having said that, it might be very hard for us to move them from their positions. And the technique is very simple. Show them, present them how users actually use it, okay? This is one. The bad news and the good news is, are the same. The good news is that you can convince people in so many people, in so many cases. And the bad news is that it's not unique for any existing product. It can be the same for any new product, okay? Let me give you an example. I want everyone who listens for us, if it's okay to ask our listeners, to think about what should be, should be the brand new car. Let's get back to cars, okay? Of, or motorcycle, okay? What should be the brand new, new, completely different motorcycle? And if I ask someone to close their eyes, you to close your eyes for a second and think about it, you'll get up with a design and not with a requirement list, like product should start with, right? So you won't say it should have an engine which has no um, air pollution, and you won't say probably it should be bigger wheel or smaller wheel. You will immediately imagine sort kind of a motorcycle, right? I think it works. I see by your smile it happened to you as well. It happens to us every any time that we do anything. Now, having said that, if you are even designing a new product and you even don't have the prototype for this product, in most cases you have some imaginary, some imagination or some idea about the way it's gonna look like. Unfortunately, by the way, but that's life. Everyone, me, you, anyone. So having said that. This bias of, well, it should look A and not a B based on my user research, based on my observations, based on whatever it is, on the literature I read, it will bias you as well. We are human beings. Designers are human beings as for now. So that's the bias. Uh, yes, this is one. And of course, there are the political aspects here. If you're talking about an early stage startup in which the entrepreneurs are the product managers, the marketers, the CEO and the CFO, then changing things are much easier. If you're talking about a product which is part of a huge or bigger suit of products in the company, there are many, many constraints out there and you have to take them into account. But, that, but this is life, of course. Can you share with us one of your um, case studies or one of your actual kind of projects that you did where you went into like a company that has used or designed um, their product in a certain way for a very long time and then kind of after your recommendation they decided to switch kind of how difficult was it to to persuade them to change that way and what, what was the impact that came after it yes actually I, I can give you an example and of course i'm always i can only share examples which are out there with no nda and so forth and um, i helped <laughs> uh, to create a point of sale cashier stations and 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 i took it in a completely different way than typical cashiers because i looked where the ends are and what should be the height of the hand, okay, and when should I place the um, the screen itself, and now uh, what should be the design, because keep in mind, for example, if you are using a touch screen, your hand is always hiding what's behind, right? So if you're walking all day long 
pressing, clicking buttons, then where should I locate the things should be completely different. And the end result is typically in a completely different place than their traditional mouse and screen design, okay? In this case, it was really easy for me to convince them because, I mean, it was true and they immediately saw the value of it. But, um, you know, I think it has much to do with culture and for a very great extent, of course, uh, for culture, interpersonal skills and so forth. And in Israel, for example, where I live, it's kind of very common to disagree with anyone else. I mean... That's, that's part of our culture. So it's perfectly okay to say to someone, doesn't matter if he or she are superior to you or equivalent to you or below you, I do agree with you or I don't agree with you and I want to suggest this and that. So I guess the conversation itself, it's easier in the business environment I work with. And around the globe, it depends on the country. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't do it, but it's all about being polite, of course. And do so. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share any negative examples here as these are my clients. Um, there aren't many, to be honest. Um, I think that if you get into a good discussion, if, if it's okay, I would like to take your question and switch it or use it in a slightly different way. How can you overcome such conflicts or such? If someone is mm. in love with what she or he is doing as a, in the product or design, how can you overcome a new thing in different ways? The UX expert. What should you do? And I think one of the main things is, uh, is sharing the reasoning behind it. I think that when people hear the reasoning behind, in so many cases, it helps them to get off the places. This is one. And the second thing is show them how users actually use the applications. So it's not from my personal experience, but it's very well common. It's well documented. If you have a problem with convincing someone about improvement needed to be done in his or her product, and it's a good idea to ask them to join you to usability testing, as I explained before. And then they will see with their eyes the challenges that users are facing with. So typically it's okay. Okay? So this is the second technique. So either you can, or you can both, uh, share, the, of course, the um, reasoning behind. And, of course, you can ask them to see how do they actually use the, their product and overcome any objections there. I think an, another important bias that we need to try and overcome is confirmation bias, right? So for example, if two people have different conflicting hypotheses about, about what good product is, and then they hear the same user saying ex the exact same thing to both of them, they will interpret it in very different ways. Right? So how do you get your team to kind of overcome this confirmation, self-fulfilling um, bias? That's a great question. So first of all, for our, uh, for our listeners, um, confirmation bias, as you said correctly, Parit, it's all about the way that we can't, uh, we were seeking for information which will validate or will support our predispositions about anything, right? So, for example, if I see a usability testing, let's b get straight into business, and I see someone who's hesitating by using the, the application if to press button A or button B. Should I put it in the basket or buy now, okay? So and let's assume I'm the UX guy and I think it's better for us to make sure that they will buy something right now. It's more of a business thing, but the happy path, the happy path is what we call the way that I want my users to go is A and not B, okay? And the other cloud and the other stakeholder in, in the company thinks it should be B, okay? So we observe a person using it and the person might say, or the user might say, think aloud, remember? Um, okay. I want to buy this one, but maybe I would like to buy another one. I'm not sure. I hope that I won't lose it, okay, when I put it into the basket. A very innocent sentence. Now, if I'm in favor of going directly to sell now, then I will get attached to the other part, which says I might lose it, as the user said, hypothetically. But if I'm all biased to buy more, I will be completely hearing only the first part of the sentence, which is, well, maybe I would like to buy some more things, right? Some more stuff, okay? Uh, the usability uh, uh, testing gives you a great opportunity to overcome such bias. Few tips. One, work in teams, not by yourself. If you work in team, there are more chances that if you have any bias, and typically we do have some biases, the other person in the room or the other observer or the other researcher will help you find out um, about it. That's one. 
even to be aware of it, it's a good start, even, okay? And he or she, and it happened to me in person so many times when my colleague told me, but have you heard what they said here and that? And I said, right you are, I missed that because it's a confirmation bias, that's only human. This is one. Second, you can set up or define what is good in advance. Okay, whenever we're talking about usability, there are three aspects. There are effectiveness, there's efficiency, and there's satisfaction. Okay, you can read more about the ISO standard. There's an ISO standard uh, for usability. But this ISO standard states, states that there is a effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. Now, effectiveness is my ability to make the whole process or the whole usage of the application correctly till the end and accomplish it. Let's assume you want to buy something online, so effectiveness-wise, it's a good interface if I could manage to get into the site, search for something, add it to my basket, pay for it, and get it to my home, okay, deliver it to my home. Efficiency is how efficient I am, how many mistakes have I done, what should I, how many um, critical uh, times have I opened the help, hopefully there's no help anymore, and so forth and so forth, okay? How much time did it take me, how many mistakes, and so forth. And satisfaction is, of course, satisfaction. You can talk about the emotions down the road if you like. I think it's a fascinating thing. Okay, so having said that, if you design your research the right way, you will immediately define yourself what are the success factors or, what are the, or measurements, sorry. So you may say, okay, if someone will be able to, uh, to buy this product within 23 clicks or 30, 37 seconds or minutes with no more, not more than three mistakes, all of a sudden this bias will slightly be eliminated because you can compare it to something objective such as human behavior. I hope it helps in a way, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's really, really challenging. So let's say theoretically, we now have our team of UX UI researchers who are free of bias and we go out to our users and we do this testing. The next challenge becomes, how do you get the user to speak the truth? Right? Because I think we talked earlier, or at least you talked earlier about cultural differences um, between um, different countries. I think in Thailand, um, one of the very nuanced um, culture that we have is that people tend to be quite overly considerate when they're asked to test a certain product. They don't really want to say negative things about that product um, to that team. So are there any techniques about how to get um, the users or the, the people who come and try the product to actually say the truth about how they feel about it? First of all, I've been to Thailand twice to work with startups and I'm, I really love this cultural thing. It's so easy to work. It's, people are polite. And the discussion is great, in my opinion, and that's great for me. Uh, but yes, absolutely. People don't want to say negative things about things that you have designed. Not only in Thailand, by the way, even in Israel, we tend to be much more direct. People don't feel at ease to say to you, the designer, this is a really bad and terrible design and I will never use it again. Okay, so first of all, let's tackle this in a few, from a few angles. First of all, there's a huge difference between attitudes and behavior. And anyone who's making UX must remember that. Okay, there are attitudes toward the product and there is a certain behavior with the product, okay? And if you can try, please, I can't, beg more for anyone who's running UX research, always start by measuring the behavior and not the attitudes. Because attitudes and behaviors are, behavior are connected, but very, not in a very strong way. For example, if I ask someone, let's assume it's a rainy day, I'm unfortunately at the flat tire and I can't open the wheel hand joints, okay? And I will ask you to stop and help me. Most people will say, yes, of course I will stop and help you. Uh, what would happen in real life? Who knows? Probably slightly different, right? So think about that. Um, it's not that behavior or attitudes anticipate behavior. This is number one. So first, try to avoid asking someone a question at the beginning, of course, such as, um, would you buy this product? Or, Do you like this product? Is this product, uh, does this product looks like a, as a product that you're going to use and so forth? Because... First of all, you put them in a very, very uncomfortable place. And second, um, you're actually asking them to make opinion about something which is probably not connected too much to behavior. So start with tip number one, start with behavior. Tip number two, if anyone will read any basic guidance, a book or article regarding user research, okay, you will find out that instructing the users is highly important. For example, 
I talk, I'm not talking about the legal aspects that must take into account, of course, but that's for each and every country and each and every person. I'm talking about the moral thing. Don't pressurize them and so forth. That's, of course, do read about it if you, run, you want to run usability testing. Uh, but in addition to that, it's about cultural thing and uh, emotional thing and say, always emphasize, we are not testing you. In case you won't be able to do something, would find it hard to do something, then keep in mind, it means that our product must be improved. From my experience, and all my experience from thousands of researchers all over the globe, I'm not a researcher by, by definition, but I do it a lot, and this helps a lot. Because the minute the participant in your application testing, and keep in mind, they are not the subject. We are not testing the users. We are testing the application. It's really important for us to for me for, to emphasize this point. So the minute the person knows that he or she are not being tested, what is being tested is the application and not them. First, it will be much easier to say out loud whatever they think. And B, of course, I will increase a little bit, a bit the bias of, hey, I don't want to insult you. But the minute you tell them that, hey, um, the more things that you're going to share with me, the more I will be able to um, improve my product, it typically helps a lot. This is one. And B, Behavior doesn't lie. The minute you see someone, uh, not I'm saying that anyone lies, of course, uh, but the behavior is not really biased, okay? That's a more, it's a, a, a more correct uh, terminology here, okay? So whenever you are using the application and you actually see the places when people find it hard to be used, you don't even need them to tell you that this, this place around your application, your product needs a further more uh, development, okay? But yes, um, Parit, there's no way you can avoid it. People don't like to insult other people. doesn't matter which culture we're talking about. People don't find it. Um, the only tip that I can, one more tip, is if you're going to test your product within different cultures, it's always a good idea to take someone from the local culture to better explain to you. Okay? It's a very good idea. For example, smile. Smile might mean something, A, here in Israel, might be slightly different in other countries. So smiling, even though it's generally a good sign, sometimes smiles is being nervous in some cultures and so forth. So keep that in mind. And I'm not saying that one culture is better than other cultures, just difference, of course. So you have to take this into account and make sure that you understand even body language, okay? In Israel, we tend to move our hands all the time. You see me, right? I'm moving it all the time. That's the way. In some countries, it's perceived as, oh, this person is so tensioned right now. No, I'm not tension. That, that's the way that Israeli people speak, okay? But in Thailand, people don't move their hands that much when they speak, which is perfectly okay in both cases. Just make sure that you understand even the body language. Yes. Um, if I extrapolate that point a little further, does that also mean that it's quite, it can be quite challenging for a certain company to expand its product overseas? Um, because what kind of customers in another country might want or what they're used to or what they feel makes a good experience is very different. And do you have any kind of um, good kind of best practice examples that you've seen of a certain company who have expanded their product overseas and then adjusted um, certain things in their product to make it more suited to that market? Absolutely, absolutely. So first of all, keep in mind, we are all human beings almost the same. I guess me and any or you and anyone uh, we, uh, shared 99.90 something percent of the genes with uh, any other person in this universe, right? So we're essentially kind of the same. The, the difference between human beings is are much smaller than we think about, okay? This is number one. B, having said that, there are market preferences and so forth. I heard that some drinks are more um, sweet in some countries compared to other countries. I only heard about it. I know, I'm not sure if it's true or not. I have no clue. Uh, but yes, certain adjustments must be made. For example, there are some countries in which uh, images are not very widely spread or used. And there are some countries in which there are many more, much more um, images should or, or are being typically used, okay? I think that in Thailand, um, images, I, I haven't read, I haven't, it's just my impression that images and uh, emojis in Thailand are much more being used than, for example, in Israel, but I haven't checked it. Is it right, by the way? I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, yes. Just, just I as will a, love that emojis, yes. <laughs> just as an example. So let's assume I want to design an instant messaging system, right? It doesn't matter. It can be WhatsApp, it can be Line, it can be anything else, right? 
So for one country, I might be more focused on text, and for other countries, I might be more focused on images. So I might open the image keyboard uh, for the Thai market before I open the text one, and vice versa. For example, I'm just making some imaginary design. I'm not, as I'm not asking WhatsApp or Line to design anything new, right? But for example, you can use it. But keep in mind that usability or UX design, we spoke a lot about research, but UX design, a good one, might be very flexible in certain cases, okay? I'm not referring to the case that you say the user will decide because users typically don't decide. They typically get with their start with, with their um, presets so or what you, they got out of the box, out of the factory, and they will typically stay there in many, many cases. But I'm saying, but flexible in the way that you can introduce it to different markets. So if, for example, um, for one market you will use 100 images and for the other market you will use 1000 that's something it's probably just a question of magnitude if you would like to create marketplace for images completely different part of the product so it might be that you design this part for a specific market and it happened to me a lot okay um but having said that just to conclude and um, one thing keep in mind that in most cases most people are kind of the same Fortunately, and it's a good optimistic way of looking at, the, at our lives in our universe. We are almost the same. And B, of course, you can make UX solutions for the differences, such as hierarchy design or multi-level layers design, to be more precise, in which some layers have been exposed more or less. Or, and of course, sometimes you have to design specific uh, modules for specific markets, of course. โปรโมชั่นพิเศษสำหรับคุณผู้ฟัง In the Name of Work Podcast ถ้าสนใจคอนเทนต์จากสปีกเกอร์ระดับโลกแบบนี้อีกสามารถใช้โค้ด Salmon S A L M O N เพื่อเป็นส่วนลด 10% เข้าชมงาน Corporate Innovation Summit หรือ CIS ปี2020 Event Virtual Experiential Conference ที่จะจัดขึ้นในวันที่15ถึง17กันยายนนี้เปิดขายบัตรแล้ววันนี้ทางเว็บไซต์ cis.riexcel.com ย้ำนะครับ cis.riexcel.com แล้วเจอกันครับ yep, so we talk about user preferences being shaped um, to a extent by where they come from um, are user preferences also shaped by history Um, so, for example, if they're very used to a certain, let's say, like a food delivery service being done in a certain way, it makes it very difficult for a new player to come in and say, "We're going to revamp that kind of user experience," right? Or similarly, if I think of like my experiences at the airport, like we're so used to kind of the, the, the standard kind of check-in process of step one, step two, step three, such that if I were to land at an airport and find a very different set of um, or sequence of um, activities, then I will feel a bit. Kind of automatically a bit uncomfortable. You're absolutely right. Take an airport for an example. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about an airport. Let's assume that I want to be to get a completely different UX experience. User experience. It's actually customer experience. It's what you call CX, customer experience. But it's mm. that's okay in an airport. So if, for example, if I possess my phone and let's assume that someone can recognize my phone using NFC or whatever it is, which every phone I think possess these days. Okay, and let's assume that um, I want to get into the room. Okay, then uh, into the airport, and theoretically I could walk with my phone. Some some device will recognize me, knows that I'm at the airport, will immediately and and so forth. So I can simply go through just walking and get to my to the airplane. Right, theoretically, I'm not sure that security wise it would be doable, but something like that. Right, and um, but yes, absolutely. But when you say about experience, there are two aspects there. In my opinion, of course, UX-wise, only UX-wise. First of all, it's habits, the way that you think about things, and this is what you call mental model. Mental models in this field of UX, it's let's put it from a different way. Um, whenever you're using a, a product, you always think about it. You have some perception about the product, okay? And this is what we call mental model. It always made of four components: what it contains, oh. How is it built? Why is it built the same? It built or why? It, what it contains? Why it contains? What it contains? How it works? 
and why it works the same it worked, the way it works, right? And we have a mental model about everything in life, okay? In Zoom, there's an application at my end, there's an application at your end, and there's the internet, and the internet sends you my video, and it sends me your video and voice, so we can talk. This is a mental model, okay? A smartphone, you can still, we still call them smartphones, right? It's so weird. It used to be these phones, right? Remember this one? Yes. Mm. Have you seen such device in the passing year? Now I have one just as a reminder, okay? And this is a smartphone. This is a piece of glass of whatever, right? So this is a smartphone, okay? And if this is a smartphone, um, why is it a smartphone? Let's go to the mental model. It's a phone, which is smart. There's a computer there. It's built out of screen and a phone inside. And since we have a screen and connection to the internet, how it works, then we can use some apps and download apps and use apps and so forth. So we have a mental model for smartphone. Now, this is so weird. I mean, this is in the phone. This is a little computer with some communication abilities, right? It is so weird. It has nothing to do with phones, okay? But hey, getting back for business, it means, um, it, it means that we create some concept of something. Now, we all have concepts of something. Think about the car. Let's go back to our car example. I think it's a good idea to use the same example along from time to time, okay? How a car is being built, there's a, a power, power station at the front called the engine, there's a driver, and there are passengers behind the driver or inside the driver, right? And it has four wheels. Now, it should immediately resemble to a carriage and a horse, right? There's a power source in the front, there's a driver in between, and of course, there are passengers at the back. Now, why cars are being built that way it's being built that way because horse and carriages used to be built that way. We even measure the power of the engine in horsepower. It's so weird. I mean, horses, 2020, almost 2021, and we're talking about horsepower. By the way, a horse has more than one ho horsepower. It's so funny, by the way. I checked it out. Um, one horse possesses more than one horsepower, uh, much more actually. I think it's seven or ten. I'm not sure about that, something around that, if I'm not all mistaken. Um, um, but it's built the way it's built because we are based on... Now, this is in the global way. So whenever you design a product, UX-wise, you, you have to ask yourself, what would be the mental model of the user by using it, okay? And if you think about it, um, you simply must, must, must make sure that the mental model that will be created within the users will be easy to understand, simple, and in so many cases, it is based on other products. For example, I can give you a challenge if you'd like. Um, give me a name of an application within your smartphone which doesn't have the equivalent in real physical life. Does it have an equivalent in real physical life? Yes. Email, it's, it's an e-electronic mail. Oh, you wear the letter, we had the address to, and there was the letter yeah. inside. And if you want to attach something, there was a, there's a clipper. The same way it looks in emails. Um, <laughs> voice recorder that you are recording must you know the voice recorder that used to be. Even the buttons look the same. The record, play, pause. Okay. Can you give me an example? I, it would be very hard for you. You might find something, but it would be very hard for you. What would you say is the analog version of Facebook? Facebook? You have a wall. Newspaper. <laughs> yes, a wall. And you stick notes there. And there are posts, you know, post it. You can all go to this wall and read it and write down some comments over the wall. Oh, it's it's completely physical wall. I can keep on with that for hours. Trust me. It's very <laughs> hard to find. <laughs> this is because human beings need to create mental models and put it on the other side. Whenever you're a designer, you want to create a great mental model. Now, I'm not now. I'm not saying that it's a must to be based on something existing. But in so many cases, it's very easy for human beings to be based on something which is already existing. Any word processing, doesn't matter if it's Microsoft, Google, whatever, okay? It's a piece of paper, right? And you write something. And if you want it to, uh, to move text, it's a blank text. You can't read anything. You have to cut it. And the, the icon is scissors, right? And you put it in the clipboard. And then you glue it, you paste it somewhere else. It's a completely one piece of paper, right? And you could theoretically go back to the ancient Egyptian. If one of the mummies would wake up and you would have to tell this mummy, okay, 
Uh, Mumi, you are the, this dead people, right? Hopefully um, back in life one day. Um, <laughs> and explain to them how to use any word processing uh, application today. They will immediately understand because it's a piece of paper. And instead of mm. ink and feather, you're using the keyboard. That's the only difference. Okay? So having said that, as for your question, you want to make things as clear as possible and you want to create mental models. Now, mental models means that you are relying on your past history in many, many cases. Okay? So if, for example, save, okay, means that what's written in the dialog box will be done right now. This is completely subconsciously um, using pre-existing knowledge within the users. And one tip I can provide any of our audience, be very careful and think 100 times before you break any convention. Because the minute you break any convention, that's the place that your application is going to work very, very bad. Okay, if, for example, the OK would be the cancel and the cancel would be OK. If, for example, the X on the upper right side instead of being on the upper right side, would be on the lower side of the screen and so forth, life will be hard. Let's take this example for a second. Let's assume there's a screen here. Just this is the back of the phone, mind, okay? And let's assume there's a screen here and the X of closing the window won't be placed here. I want to place it near my thumb, right here. So this is the close, right? It's one of the most, mm. uh, it's here. If I place the X here, probably nobody will notice that it's there. Even though UX-wise, it might be better. Convention-wise, disaster. Okay, so... Mm. Always think about that. Yes. So convention wins in that case then? Yes, I'm not saying that you should be or using only convention. I'm not saying not being creative. I'm just saying that always be minded as a UX designer to make sure that f at least you understand the conflicts between what is common within users and what you are actually doing right now. And you can be very much creative. Yes. Coming back to your concept of your uh, mental model and example of a smartphone, um, I think that kind of illustrates the importance of anchoring your product on something else. I guess I throw this question to you. How would the adoption rate of smartphones have been different had it not been presented initially as a smarter version of a phone, but rather a smaller version of a computer? Do you think that has any implications on, from a business angle at all? Let's talk about an, an old phone, okay? I'll just disconnect this. Yes. It has a cable, of course. I'll leave the cable so in case people will see that, okay? So that's that was the original phone, right? The, the keyboard that you could click it and you can get on the C fold. And that was the shape of the headset. And it looked to be like, like a banana shape. So you can... I'm not talking to anyone right now. It's disconnected, okay? This way, right? By the way, till today in Israel, I'm not sure about Thailand. In Israel, if you want to say some, you see friends far away in a noisy street and you want to tell this person, call me. You see, call me. It's like the dial. You say, okay, I know I'm not sure. Is this gestures appearing in, still being used in Thailand? I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I think it, I think that's a global, yeah, a global sign. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, just for once again, be very minded about hand gestures in UX design and UI design. Hand gestures in one country might be great and in another country may be insulting like hell. Be very careful about hand gestures in your design. Don't use hand gestures, okay? It's really, in Israel, for example, if a class teacher wants you to say something, she will, know. he will tell you, yes, Jacob, now you. In so many countries, it's very insulting to do this, now you, okay? Um, but having said that, so this one, so if let's talk about the, the smartphone, okay? Let's go back to the smartphone. It started by such kind of phones. And we're still doing this, but and if you look at your phone, I don't know if you have an iPhone, an Android, or any other operating system, you find that the phone itself within the smartphone, the icons for call is green headset. It's so weird. If you think about it, this should be call me later. This should be call me, right? Because phones look like a flat piece of glass today. So this is call me, right? But nobody does call me. You know, I, I mean, I, <laughs> people think I'm crazy, but this is the call me, right? But it's still left. So we started with smart with phone, and then they added some SMS abilities. And then there was the MMS. I'm not sure that all of our young audience knows that, but there was an SMS short messaging system. And then there was an MMS, multimedia a mess, multimedia messages system, okay, that you could send pictures and then you could send 
videos, and then there came the first smartphones, and so forth. So since it evolved on a continuous way from old phones, nobody actually took the time and said, okay, let's design something completely different. By the way, properly, very rightfully, because if you would do something completely different, there's always a chance that people won't understand that. Okay? So to make a long story short, um, I'm not saying that you must rely on other concepts. I'm just saying two things. One, never or try, do your best not to get into conflict with other UX examples to usage of products as much as you can, of course. And B, of course, being creative is always a good idea. And having said that, and B, yes, you can rely on other products, of course, making sure that the IP is not voided and so forth. I mean, that you're okay with that. But in many, many cases, you can make go slightly farther or nearer the original concept, okay? Um, the use is that, so it's up to Uber or any other, um, any other um, um, transportation application. It's as if you're talking about a virtual, and I shouldn't be adding. When I say virtual, mm, I mean, okay, I want to think about it as the mm, now think about it virtually wise. Okay, so you could order pizza over the phone, you see, you should say over the phone, and you can order it by your smartphone, but it's essentially the same. Even the conversation is the same. Hello, what's your name? Jacob. Sometimes they will ask me, sometimes they won't. What would you like to order? Go to any pizza ordering system in the universe. It was start with the product itself, not with your address. And in some cases, they will ask you at the beginning, hey, hey, Let's make sure that we, the delivery area, you're within the delivery area. The same way that the guy over the phone will tell you, hey, pizza, Jacob's pizza. I don't, I'm not sure there's any Jacob pizza in the universe, but that's a Greenspan's pizza. Yes, um, but before we start, I don't want to waste your time. What is the delivery? Uh, where do you live? So I want to make sure that our delivery system goes there. And I will tell them I live here and there. And they say, okay, let's all keep on. Same goes to any, and so forth and so forth. So you can easily see that it's not a physical resemblance when I'm talking about mental model, I'm talking about the logical resemblance, okay? No one designs engines that should be looking like horses, but essentially they are the same, <laughs> okay? Yeah. I think a, a common theme that um, is covered by all the topics we talked about today, um, whether it's to do with biases of people conducting the, the research, whether it's biases that users have, um, from the experiences of using a certain product in a certain way. Um, I mean, all of that is to do with kind of human psychology, right? How important is this field um, in terms of being able to understand how people make decisions, how people feel, how people behave? How important is that um, as a discipline for a UX UI expert to have? That's a great point. Um, first of all, when you say psychology, let's define psychology, okay? Most people think about psychology about the way that people feel and emotions and and something like this, right? I guess that that's what you meant originally. But keep in mind that psychology for me as a UX expert, as a PhD in cognitive psychology, is, for example, um, the way that you think. For example, or the or processing system. For example, we have very limited ability to retrieve information from our memory. Okay, you remember so many things, but when I ask you to... Hey, say out loud, what is your phone number? Most people will find that it is, right? And when I'll tell you, okay, great. Remember that you had a phone 10 years ago? What was that number 10 years ago? And I would say, hmm, and then I will be able to retrieve it, okay? Or for example, there are many, many abilities and limitations right now. Um, we think, for example, that we see a uh, screen, fully vivid colors, but we see only 60 degrees of colors. And... Practically, we have about 10 degrees of attention focusing abilities and about two and a half, depending on how tired you are, and even less of ability to really process information. This is exactly the reason why anyone who watched me right now don't have a clue about the way that my eyeglasses look like. Right, Barry? How does my eyeglasses look like? Can you describe them? You don't have a clue, I guess. I assume. <laughs> Nobody has, but they were not only you and no one. Why is that? Because we are focusing our attention in, hopefully, listening to me and looking, not looking at my face, right? So this would happen all the time. The same way that I know that you have an earphones and I don't have a clue if they are wireless or not. 
only now I can try and find out if they're wireless or not. I have no clue because my brain wasn't busy processing this information. Now, what I'm trying to say is this is psychology for me, not only for me. This is what we call cognitive psychology. So having said that, it's all about psychology. So it's always about the fit. So if we're talking about the fit between um, the product and the user, it's users' abilities, and one aspect is, of course, the way they can process information, and the other one are emotions. Now, keep in mind, um, emotions are being evoked anytime, any minute that you're going to do something. Right now, every listener in this room or everyone who listens to us, anyone walking on the street out there, anyone has immediately emotion response to anything we are doing. Okay, so you open an app and you feel, <gasps> wow, that's an emotional response, okay? And then you find it hard to use it and you say, hmm, there's an emotional response. Let me give you an example, okay? Um, if there's an application which UX-wise isn't designed the good way, okay? If you are a young person, like you are, you will probably say, hmm, this application is really, really bad in design. I don't like it emotions, right? I don't like it. Um, I feel um, that it's wasting my time. That's emotion. I don't trust it. It's an emotion immediately. Let's take the same application, as we said before, to a very a much older pe- person, okay? Typically, not necessarily, but typically, older people, much older people, tend to say, I'm not capable of using this application. I'm too old for that. That's another emotion, okay? That's another emotion, which means I'm a little bit slow, I'm not tech savvy, or my tech savviness is challenged, and so forth and so forth. This is a completely different set of emotions. Now, we are talking about the exact same product. Keep in mind, just two different persons, and we're talking about the same product, which we know that the usability of this product is a poor one. But when you give the two different people, they will have different emotions, so different types of people. So A, emotions are there, and B, emotions are highly personalized, but are highly common to many people, okay? So when you have a great application, for example, if you get a new message in a line or in WhatsApp, I always give only good examples out there. Sorry, that's I'm a good person. I'm trying to be as optimistic as possible. You feel, what surprise, right? This is, and you reopen and you see the first two lines with three dots and you must and then curiosity arises immediately, and you must read it. Perfect. Great design. Okay? That's a great emotional design, right? And having said that, you immediately create an emotion while you're seeing that. And of course, sometimes if I will send you a message, a parade, you will get one emotional response, and if someone, closer friend of you, will send you a message, you'll probably get more excited, but that's perfectly okay. Um, But you'll get some emotions. So you must understand that psychology-wise, other than, I'm putting aside for a second, this ability to process information. We can uh, talk about it later on if you'd like. But talking about emotional, emotions are always there and it will be almost a vote, either you like it or not, as a designer, of course. And it's a good idea to control, not to control emotion, it sounds really bad, to try to design which emotions do you want to evoke in a good, honest way, of course. Don't trick your users, never ever. Don't lie to your users, never ever. But it's perfectly okay to design a system that will make people feel at ease or happy or funny or whatever you decide in a good, uh, honest way. So yes, when you design UX, you, for a very great extent, have to design the emotional state of the user. If that's what you meant by psychology, by the way. I hope that I got you the right answer. Yep. Um, I guess pushing on that a little further, right? How... Is it the responsibility of the product manager and UX UI team to try to invoke certain emotions as well? So let me give you an example, right? When we go into like a hotel, um, sometimes you're confronted by like a sign in the bathroom saying things like the majority of guests in this room only use one tower, one towel across the, the entire duration of their stay. I mean, that straight away um, invokes an emotion of, of guilt, right? If you were to use the tower kind of more than um, only once and then and then using a different a different tower the next day. Now, is that in the scope of a good UX UI team as well, to be able to invoke certain emotions at different touch points to kind of nudge um users towards a certain um a choice or a certain decision? 
I love your example, Paris. Let's talk exactly talk about this uh, example, okay? The sign at the hotel room is no different from any application that you'll buy. It's not uh, different from a 3D design system or a very small app. It's just the same. This is a machine, fortunately or unfortunately a piece of paper, but it's a machine that you have to interact with. Now, other people who use this hotel used only one immediately will evoke a, a sense of guilt. I've been to, as you... Before the COVID virus, I was flying about 130-something days. I was outside home flying somewhere to help startups or companies. That's what I was doing for my living before the COVID. Now I'm doing something else for my living. Just the same, actually, just remotely. <laughs> But having said that, I've, so I've been traveling. I think that I stayed at at least 10, 20 hotels each year. Okay, And some signs are phrased in a different way. We really want to keep our environment good and clean. If you use the same towel, something like this, okay, we won't, able, we won't be needed to wash additional towels so we can save the planet. Same message, completely different emotion set, right? One, I feel proud about myself. Oh, I'm such a good person. I haven't used the towel right now. I used the, the one from yesterday, so I saved the planet. And the other one, <laughs> if you just use the, the other one, you're a mean guy, right? Um, so we have to, so for this extent, if you're a product designer, if you're a UX designer, in this case, it's a CX designer, customer experience. Yes, you want to create as positive emotions uh, possible, right? So to be uh, effective, probably. To be nice to the users, probably it's the positive messaging. Effectiveness, I haven't heard about the research which compares this to, but I guess both would be effective. So it's always good to go with the good experience. Keep in mind that when you look at research, you can easily find that negative or bad experience is being remembered for much longer time than positive experiences. So if you're creating a product and you provide it as one part of the product, Negative, if you create a negative experience, aka negative emotions will evoke there, people will remember that for much longer period of time than positive emotions. Okay, so this is another thing that UX experts know and they use it. It's not only creating positive emotions, it's almost as important, even more important, to avoid creating negative emotions. Because you see, it's not that the positive emotions are here and negative emotions are here and there's a line between them. I think, in my humble opinion, there's a positive emotion and there's a negative emotions. And you can, at the same exact product, possess high positive emotions within high negative emotions. It's just the same. Okay? And the towels example you gave is a perfect one. I want a clean, dry towel in the morning. Now, I can use my the one from yesterday night and it's not already dried, semi-dried. So I have a negative emotion of, you know, not using a really clean, shiny, great smelling uh, towel, but I have the same time of positive emotions of saving the planet. And I do save the planet. I'm not cynical by that. Of course, I mean, laundry is making some pollutions, right? So if you can do it, that's just awesome. So you can easily see that both of them are there. And yes, absolutely. It's one, one of the most important tasks, actually, of UX designer. Keep in mind, always in a good, honest way, never trick your users, never give them any false uh, information, never lie to them, always in a good, honest way. But creating good emotions is always great. Is there an ethical line that each kind of UX UI team need to consider <laughs> uh, when they think about that when they think about designing or nudging um, a certain choice Ooh, or a certain experience? That's that can be turned into a full podcast. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> there's a line. For, by the way, for every one of us, right? Even a, any human being walking on this earth has their own, you know. Uh, the ethics lines, right? Um, will I steal from a supermarket? No, I will never. Other people, do they steal from supermarkets? Yes, from time to time they do. Okay, people do. So, and so forth and so forth. I can show you my own ethical line, but I'm not saying that it's the right one or the only one. But yes, surely everyone has ethical lines. I never trick my user. I never lie to my users. I never do anything which manipulates them. I always try, my, my number one concern is to make sure that 
the value or what I get out of the product that I design will be equivalent or in match with the emotions that this design has. So if, for example, I'm making something that will make people better communicate, which is a hypothetical example, doesn't matter. So if I design a system that will help them better invest their money, so if the emotion of, hey, I'm saving money uh, will be there the right way, it's perfectly okay. If I'll give them a feeling that, hey, you're saving money and actually the product tries to, to invest more in an inefficient, bad way, good for the designer, bad for them, that's completely immoral in my opinion that I will never ever do so. Okay, so you see, um, it's kind of easy, but it has to do with each and human uh, human beings. Yes. I mean, one example I can think of is those kind of lengthy terms and conditions, right? Where they, when you start using a certain um, application or product, they ask you to kind of tick the box saying you agree to order <laughs> or the various articles and conditions. I mean, I think very few of us actually end up reading that, right? Is there a way to make that experience a little bit um, better, but also a little bit more kind of more to the real situation where where we all know that people don't really read those terms and conditions in detail? Actually, I can see if it's okay, I would like to split uh, your question into two parts, Paris. First of all, I, I think that the terms and conditions, it's not what we call dark UX. There's an expression, dark UX which means that you design something in a fishy way that will make people, hmm, or dark patterns, there are many names for that, okay? So this is dark UX, like a dark nature, but, but you know, um, so there's, I don't think, in my humble opinion, terms and condition is a dark UX because it's all there, it's written, and people should be able to understand it, okay? Nobody tricks you. It's there. As for the user experience, you know, it's an awful experience because nobody, most people, sorry, I assume, don't read it and say, oh, in section J1, it's written that, okay? Um, so most people don't, but is it a good experience? Probably it's not. Is it a dark pattern? I don't think it's a dark pattern. I think it's good and honest. Dark pattern is, for example, that uh, you check box something and all of a sudden you find out yourself floated with a, a junk email because you said in a really tricky sentence, I'm willing that you will share my knowledge with everyone, you know, something like this, you know. Um, this is dark pattern, in my opinion. It's not just in Robio. Um, but having said that, this is the one part that you asked, okay? This is the dark pattern. As for the other part, I think that being clear and easy to understand, it's always a good goal for the customers as well as for the product managers. And I've, I hope that I answered your question, but uh, I don't find it uh, something problematic. By the way, terms and condition, it's, I think it's just a legal constraint that you have to follow. That's the, I, I'm, I would be highly surprised if most people or, or most product managers on the planet would like to keep on with their terms and conditions, but they, it's, you know, there are some legal restrictions out there. So people try to use it. Yes. Mm. Um, one other aspect that we didn't really talk about um, regarding UX, UI, I don't know if it's actually any important at all. Um, is color. Um, I mean, at least um, with the team that I'm working with at the moment at the company, we always debate about which kind of which color evokes which emotion, which color should be used for certain um, functions. Okay. Do you have a viewpoint on this? Is, is that a correct answer? Because if you Google on, if you go on Google and search what each color actually means, right, or what type of emotion each color evokes, you get a million different set of Absolutely. combination of answers. Absolutely. Colors is fascinating. I'm not, as I said before, I'm, a, I'm not a UX designer, so it's kind of hard for me. But colors are great and very dangerous at the same time. So let's talk about colors. Okay, first of all, keep in mind that the meaning, the absolute meaning of color doesn't exist. Red in many, many cultures means dangerous, and green means all is great, okay? And in some cultures, it doesn't work that way. In some cultures, red is perfectly great color, okay? Um, you can think about flags being all red in some countries, and it doesn't mean that, that it's red. I'm, I'm not familiar with the, I can't... Uh, I try to imagine the Thai, uh, Thailand uh, flag, it doesn't there, but but yes, but it means something different, okay? Um, for example, the Israeli um, flag is white and blue, and it's shaped with two stripes, which represents a, a very traditional sort kind of clothing, and dated for about 2,000 years ago, so 
So that's the flag. But back to colors. So blue and white are the colors which represent something in Judaism and in Israeli culture, okay? Red, for example, might be gender something, it might be not, but forget this emotion for a second. Let's talk, what does it mean, red? Does it mean that the, is, is, in most countries, a red, green is okay and red is problematic? And orange is a hazard in between. And what about blue? Is blue a good thing or a bad thing? Is um, yellow? And so forth and so forth, okay? This is one. Be keep in mind that some colors might mean something different. Or that's, so that's as much concerned to the meaning. Let's talk about emotions. Colors in some uh, countries, white, for example, in some colors, uh, country, uh, cultures means something more dangerous or something which is morbid. And in some cultures, is you know, it's the best thing on earth, okay? And so forth and so forth. Three, keep in mind that colors can be used for UX design. I'm saying UX and not UI. UX in a very uh, easy way. For example, color connects areas on the screen that can't be connected any other way. So if, for example, there's an area on the screen that you want to connect to a different area on the screen, for example, the same button of buy, if you paint them mm. in a distinguished way, even though they are not located in the same place, physically, it will be kind of easy for you to better understand that they are connected. So colors are great, but use them in a wise way. A, always redundant. By the way, this is class number one. Never use color as a soul, as the only indicator. Always, it should be redundant. For example, you can perfectly say, okay, in green, cancel in red. You can do that. But always make sure that there's a V and X inside the shapes, or you write okay and cancel and so forth. Never ever use a colors, uh, just as themselves, always redundant. And keep in mind, it might come as a surprise to you, that around 9% of men, only men population, suffer from color blindness. And about 0.5% of women, okay? Um, that's something completely genetical, by the way, as much as I'm aware of. But it means that 9% Around 10 men, 9 people out of 100 men won't be able to make a clear differentiation between green and red. Color blindness doesn't mean uh, black and white in most cases. I mean, people who don't see, completely don't see colors, they are pro miles of the, pro mil of the population, they are, they, are, they are really rare, okay? But red, green is very, very problematic. So be very, very careful with red and green, always. I'm not saying that you can't use red and green, you can, but it always must be redundant, okay? Don't make two graphs with two lines, one is red, one in green, at the same line, because 9% of your population won't be able to, to know which one is the one. Okay, if we take a, a step back um, from kind of the details of the design, the research, and look at the kind of the overall industry or the overall field of UX, UI, um, what do you think will be the key trends um, going forward over the next, let's say, three to five years in the field of UX, UI? What are the new things that are coming in that people in this field need to think about, need to prepare for? First, I wish I knew. Otherwise, if I, would, if I could tell you for sure, I'd be <laughs> a rich person, I guess. <laughs> but, um, and so, but and so I'm just top of my, not top of my head, but, you know, just my assumptions, of course, right? So the first thing, I guess, uh, this specialization as well as migration process will keep on. May, many more people will become UI UX, so they will provide solution for wide range of uh, customers' needs or companies' needs. And for more complex systems, I guess the differentiation will be there even more, okay? And keep in mind that one thing that happened is a huge awareness for UI UX, the importance of it, the usage of it. When I started my career back in the 90s, um, I had to, in Israel, to go to some conferences, open a little booth and say, hey, UI, there wasn't UX the days, but design. And typically people looked at me as if they would see an alien and say, but I don't get it. The developer, the one who writes the code, design the screen. So why, what are, what are you doing here? Okay, so <laughs> it happened a lot. 
And today, that's a completely different ballgame, right? Today, everybody understands it's by UI, UX. You can see that in many, many startups, there's a UX function immediately right from the beginning because people understand that that would want uh, influence the product success, not the only, no, not only parameter, but one of the most important parameters or among the most important parameters. So this is one. Second, I strongly believe that AI, machine learning, will make huge difference in... Uh, in user interface, because I guess it's my assumption, up till to now, and um, all of us are using the same user interface all the time. For example, uh, Parit, you are right now using the exact same Zoom as I do. I haven't seen your screen, but if there was a camera pointed to your screen, you probably, I would be completely familiar to me. Furthermore, even if the text is in Thai, I'm not sure if it's English or Thai, I don't know if there's a Thai version for, um, there's no Hebrew, I think, for uh, <laughs> Hebrew is the language that you speak in Israel. Um, um, I would probably recognize your screen, probably, okay? Having said that, um, I strongly believe that um, AI machine learning will enable us, the UX designers, much better tools to personalize. And when I say personalize, I'm not. I'm saying better know who's using the application or the product and better fit it to his or her needs. It's been done today. If you're shopping at Amazon or any other platform, eBay, Asos, doesn't matter where you are, okay? In most cases, the, and if you logged in, they won't suggest you products that are not the best fit for you. So it's a sort kind of personalization, right? However, having said that, um, I think that the personalization of the interface itself might take place as well. I assume, I don't see it happening right now, but it might happen, that's one. Second thing that I think that might be happening is do the COVID virus. People fly much less, people interact much more using some remote technologies. And I strongly believe that the person-to-person -person via a device will be much elaborated in this industry. For example, today, telemed let's talk about telemedicine. Everybody's talking about telemedicine, okay? For many, many years, right? But nowadays, it's much more important. If I'm in a COVID virus, in the mood to get out of my home, especially not to something, some place which might be having other sick people, then telemedicine will make a huge change. Let let's talk about education, okay? Look what I, I'm not sure about Thailand. I would happy to hear, but in Israel, for example, kids didn't go to school for so many months. Okay, so they stayed home, but school kept on using Zoom or any other any other remote. Uh, okay, which is amazing. Okay, so all of a the sudden there was a huge shift. Now, what would happen to the way that we teach kids? Right now, I think that uh, teachers still trying to use the same platforms as the old. You know. <laughs> They're standing in a class and there's a board behind them. I guess things will be changing and the interfaces or the user interface will have lots and lots of changes going on. What about kind of new forms of user interactions? Right? So we see new technologies like um, virtual reality, um, things like augmented reality being used in a lot of fields. So I think one of the effects that we saw um, with the um, coronavirus is the decline in tourism, right? I mean, it's, it's completely out of the picture. So what I don't know if you guys have this in Israel as well, but what we have in Thailand are kind of tourist attractions, creating kind of virtual experiences and virtual tours of the temples or of the ruins that they are normally, um, that, that they're looking after, right? Does that also change a lot um, in terms of the landscape for UX, UI designers um, and the fields of interest that they can go into? In a way, because let me tell you, let me tell you something, Perret. Um, first of all, if you listen to the terminology, virtual reality or augmented reality, we are talking about the reality and we're trying to imitate it virtually. We're not creating something new. We are trying to get you into the Sea of Galilee in Israel or into a very beautiful place in Bangkok. And I want a very interesting place in Bangkok. And... And, and you want to gather, okay? You want to see the local market, okay? Um, just to be honest, I, lo I loved going to the in the market, uh, many markets in Bangkok. That's one of my favorite things when I ever get there and have a few hours break from work. I always go to the market. So beautiful, okay? So if you, you go there, so can you imitate the smells and the tastes? No, you can't. As for now, can you imitate the vision? Yes, you can, but it's an imitation of the vision. So as much consent to virtual reality and augmented reality, these areas are with us for at least three or four decades, not years, decades, okay? Having said that, 
how these really new environments, theoretically they are, but they are not new for two reasons. One, we always try to imitate the physical world in this specific environment, because you want to make me feel as much as possible as if I'm walking inside the, the marketplace in Bangkok, right? Since I can't fly to Bangkok right now. So this is one, from Israel at least. This is one. And second is the interaction of itself. Yes, it's been with us for 20 or 30 or 40 years. So to make a long story short, yes, it will make an influence. Yes, people will consume much more experiences using VR glasses probably. Haven't looked at the numbers if VR glasses um, or helmets are or hoods are being sold more in the coronavirus. Interesting thing to check out. I'm not sure about that, but we have to check it out. But in my humble opinion, it will make a change. Right now, I don't see that happening, but that's my only best guess. It might be as wrong as anyone, as, as much as be right, okay? Just the same. Yeah, another thing that um, the coronavirus has accelerated, especially in developing countries, is the adoption rate of technology. Right? We see uh, people previously that were not kind of literate or were not familiar with um, technological products and services um, turning more towards kind of online products and services, right? So people becoming more familiar, more open to online banking, online education, as you mentioned, telemedicine. Um, what challenge does that pose for UX UI in terms of designing experiences or creating experiences for people who may not be so literate or previously literate with technology? That, that's a great point, yes. First of all, I think that we've been around these uh, challenges for many, many years, right? Um, whenever there's a product, there's always the early adopters, you know, there are many, uh, there are many books about that, but there's always the, uh, the first uh, adapters or the, or the pioneers in adopting any new technology, okay? So that would kind of easy with them because they are highly motivated, they really want the excitement of something new, they really want to get the latest technology and they love technology. So that's really easy. But then you come to B2C consumer products, such as phones, such as whatever it is. And all of a sudden, you have to challenge with someone who finds it kind of difficult to use certain applications and so forth. So how do you do that? Yes. So the good news is that the techniques are already there. So if you design it carefully... And if you design it in an empathetic way from the eyes of the user and you try to get into the user's head and you try to understand what do they understand and what don't they understand. So first, for me as a designer, it doesn't really matter if they know a lot or knows a little about the technology or product. Whatever is important for me is that I'll be aware of the amount of knowledge and so forth. Same goes for emotions. If they are afraid of technology, and then it's important for me to know that, so I designed something which is might be slightly less advanced, however much more easy to be accepted. Okay, so the second thing. So having said about that, I think that puts us great challenges, as you absolutely rightfully said. However, the techniques and the tools are there. There are many challenges, you just have to design it the right way. And there are many, many um, products which are for anyone Anywhere. For example, um, um, when you take a bus or a train and you buy a ticket from a vending machine, it's for everyone. You have to design it the simplest way as possible, which is great. And we know how to do that. UX experts know how to do that. That's the challenge. But yes, this is one. As much as concerned to human interaction, that makes a huge difference. As me as a UX designers, designer, sorry, working, some of my clients, I haven't met them ever. Physically, I mean, just through Zoom or Hangout or whatever application it is, okay, or Microsoft Teams, whatever. Yes, so it's kind of a challenge. I think that, uh, but that's as for the design process, not as much concerned to the end result of the cost for the customers. So I think we're we're coming towards the the latter stages of our um, episode today. I think um, the final kind of final question I wanted to ask you, um, Jacob, is. What advice do you have for kind of product managers or even fresh graduates who want to get into the field of UX UI today? What pieces of advice do you want to give to them? Kind of what tips and tricks do you want to share? Or what type of skill set should they be trying to develop to be able to succeed in this field? Okay, perfect. Great question. So first of all, understand that uh, what is right today won't be right tomorrow. It's ongoing. When I started my career is there was there weren't even smartphone I think the smartphone weren't for sure I'm not sure there was mobile phone it was the early days of mobile phones right 
uh, with these little ants, antennas that you have to pull out if you want someone to listen to you. Okay, it was back that days, right? Today I'm doing something completely different and probably within five years, so it's ongoing learning process. If you are not willing to keep on learning every second of your life, don't, in my humble opinion, don't even try getting to these areas. So you'll find yourself doing something completely different within five years time from now, unlike many other industries. And it's not good or bad, it's just different. This is one. B, keep in mind that intuition is great, but it's not a substitute to knowledge. Learn a lot. You can do your, learn by yourself. You can go to online courses. You can go to, to schools. You can have a PhD like I do. You can make an MA. You can be a BA. You can read articles. So don't have any official degree, but keep, on lear- keep in mind that you must learn. Why is that? Because typically people say intuitively, intuitively wise, this should be the solution and try to avoid intuition as much as possible. Try to base your UX designs or UI designs. By the way, same goes to UI designs. There are ways and there are methods to make the right visual design, right? And, and learn it. Learn, learn, learn. Do learn it. Third is be curious. If you are not a curious person, you ask for the characteristics. I find it very boring. You must be uh, to, to do UI UX because you'll keep on doing the same things. Curiosity and flexibility, okay? It's always, it's always be curious. And it really doesn't matter if you work in a consultancy agency or an agency that you have switched between projects every three months or half a year or two weeks or if you're working in the same industry for 10 years or the same place in a big corporate. In both cases, technology will change and human doesn't change. And you have to gap between the technology and human beings And I think that if you love this area of humans using machines, join me and many other great UX designers out there. Thank you very much, Jacob, for shedding light on this field um, today. I think I want to end with the quote that you mentioned that what got you into this field initially was um, being interested in the interaction between human and technology. So thank you for sharing um, with us today in terms of what a good product design means, Uh, what actually is UX UI, how that relates to other fields, and what are the upcoming trends that might change the landscape of this field um, going ahead. Um, For everyone out there, it's been a pleasure hosting you guys this episode. Please stay tuned for In the Name of Work podcast every Wednesday. Um, We'll be announcing later on what type of work we'll be going into uh, for the next episode. Um, Thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Hope to meet you in person soon in Thailand. Okay. Yes. See you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.